So the yield, the yields for Georgia, the average state yield is around 45. And I remember when I was scouting cotton back late 90s, early 2000s, if a farmer, farmers would tell me, hey, if we make two, two bushel, I mean, if we make two bale cotton, we'll give you a tip. And, you know, farmers would be buying new trucks and giving tips to the scouts if they made two bale cotton. Mm -hmm. Today, if you make two bale cotton, you just lost your butt. Now, some farmers are hitting four bale cotton. So we had a we had a window about 10 years ago where cotton just jumped a light year, seems like. Right. The, the yield just went through the roof, and it totally changed cotton. I think right now, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think we're we're in that window now on beans because beans has always been a 40 bushel thing, 30, 40 bushel thing. And right now we have beans like this jumping out here and these other guys making 100 bushel beans. I think possibly 10 years from now we're going to be talking about people making 100 bushel beans kind of half regular. Yeah. Uh, so I think right now we're at that point where cotton was 10 years ago where the, we figured out enough stuff where the yields fish and just really take off. Yeah, I mean, I think people, one, the genetics are getting better, right? Yeah. And um, what you see happen in the bean world is your your big bean acres are twos and threes and fours, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the Midwest plants and coming south into North Delta. And that's where the bulkier acres are. So that's where your high yield jumps start happening first. Mm -hmm. And then the sixes and sevens start falling along, five, six, and sevens, because there's just less acres of them. It just makes sense. Yeah. Um, but people have finally figured out that if they treat a bean like they would any other crop, right? There it is. Fertilize it. There it is. Take care of it. Do all the things that they yep. do on cotton. Do all the things they yep. do on peanuts. Do all the things that we do on corn. The yield potential's there. We've been kind of capping ourselves, to be honest with you. Because yep. they, th you know you know what people call a bean yep. down here. Yep. Poverty pea is what po they call it. Poverty beans, poverty pea. I told my consultant when we planted these beans, I planted about a month ahead of anybody I know down here. I put them in the ground and, uh, I said, hey, people down here consider, or in this area, consider beans a throwaway crop. He said, you're right. He said, they, they get all their land ready to plant their cotton, and they got some of it that maybe got too far out on them, got, they got behind, and said, it's too late to plant cotton. Oh, heck, just throw some beans out there. Mm -hmm. And that's how soybeans have been grown in Georgia forever. Yeah. Oh, but it's too late to do anything else, throw some beans out there. Yeah. So if you treat it like a throwaway crop, it's gonna make throwaway money. It ain't it ain't gonna it ain't gonna do right. If you make it a throwaway, it's gonna be a throwaway. You gotta treat it like cotton, treat it like peanuts if you wanna get the cash crop uh results from it. Right, yeah. You gotta fertilize it, you gotta take care of them. So just explain to the layperson what is group five, what is group eight, what what does that mean? It's just a time of that it takes for that to go from emergence to a maturity. So a group three will get ready a little quicker than a group four. A group four will get ready a little quicker than a group five and a six and a seven. And and one thing that we discussed on this is this one's a five three and this one's a five four. Well, in your field, you said you saw this start to dry down about 10 days quicker than that, even right. though it's a five three versus a five four. You know, we number these things kind of on average that you see um, in, in our breeder plots and that's across the wide geography. Mm -hmm but you got really got to grow them on your own farm because they act different in different regions. For um, sure. Would you, uh, if we were going to go for the highest yield mm -hmm. on a farm, would you reckon, let's say the farm is right here, you know, this area, and I had a field that was solid red clay and I had a field across the street that was sandy. Would it be a different variety you would recommend for the red clay as for the sand? Because the soil temperature is going to be different when we're talking about April or May, when we're talking about planting it, we're going to have different right. soil temps on those two different types of dirt. Would you recommend the same variety, or, or is there, or is y'all's variety is that fine tuned that you would say, hey, well, with that heavier dirt, you're gonna want this variety instead of that variety? Yeah, so I would probably on that sandier land, I would probably go one that's a little more aggressive, you know, a little taller growing bean. Mm -hmm. On this heavier soil, you typically can get the plant height you want out of it, and on a shorter, bushier plant type. So we would look at that. We would also look at our yield data where mm -hmm. we've had plots in those different soil types. Hey, sometimes you catch a unicorn, right? Yeah. Like yep. 48X9. 48X9 was a 2019 variety. That's the one that uh, the guy in Lee County made the high yield with. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a while, but it's one of our highest yielding yeah. group four beans. So it may you may have one that works on both, but you know it'd be one of those conversations we'd have to have. Yep. What about determinate versus indeterminate? Most of so most of our sixes and sevens are all a determinate bean. Um, the indeterminate beans, they kind of grow and flower at the same time. Determinate mm -hmm. beans kind of do what they do and they stop, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
the indeterminate beans are the ones we have the hardest time growing down here because they don't tend to weather very well for us. Mm -hmm. But your highest yields are your, in your indeterminate beans. Yeah. yeah. So, so if I, you can if you can fight through it, it's yeah. definitely worth planting them. When I planted these, I told some people that it was an indeterminate variety. They said, "Why in the world would you do that? Uh, yeah. You want them all to get ready at the same time." And that's not really exactly what it is but right the, and their mind is kind of like tomatoes indeterminate versus determinate and they say you plant an indeterminate you got some on the bottom that are way past ready and some on the top that ain't even ready yet but that's that's not really how it is they're no. just it's just continuing to flower throughout the season right. and make more and more so you have a it correct me if I'm wrong you have a potential for better yield with yeah, the yeah. indeterminate because your window for making it yeah, is longer, wider you got a longer window like with a determinate bean um, if you if you have some rough weather or whatever yeah, during is, that yep. flowering period, you can lose that set, yep. and it'll try again and it'll try again. I've seen some dry land beans try to set a crop three times, but then it's going to be over with. These are they'll kind of weather the storm if you got water to keep them going. Yeah, that's where yeah. we get hurt with an indeterminate. If we don't have the right growing conditions and they're not irrigated, then they tend to not take the stress yeah. as well because they're setting fruit and they're yeah. they have a drain on that plant itself trying yeah. to finish filling out those pods that's why i looked at with the determinant years ago uh we'd grown some beans and i did a little bit of research and there's basically about a two and a half three day three week window there in the middle of the season where if they hurt for anything during that time that's your that's yeah. it, that's it is over with and so with these you have a larger window so it's not as that's fine that's tuned. Great. You got you got you got a little bit little bit more room to play with here with, with the indeterminate. And we can have some high heat yeah. and dry weather, if, especially on a dry land bean that can mess us up when we're trying to pollinate um, yeah. on a determinate bean. So I, something else kind of interesting that we do down here that you don't see in a lot of other places is um, you know we have a long growing season. Yeah. So in the southern part of our geography behind silage and behind grain corn if we can plant our corn early and get it out in july Ooh, i've never seen this we'll plant a second crop right behind the behind the corn yeah. and uh 57 xf ones is a dominant double crop bean for us we'll plant it all the way really until about the 10th or 15th of august whoa that's late yeah and um so are you are you worried about an early frost well, you know, it's a, it's a fight, right? So yeah. we're, we're kind of, the later you get into August, the more of a gamble that you're taking. If you can get them in by say August the 7th or so in the Southern part of the state, you're pretty much gonna make a bean. Now you might make 20 bushels, <laughs> or if you have yeah. a warm fall, you yeah. might make 70 bushels yeah. to plant a double crop. Yeah. I have planted some, I had a guy plant some in Edison, not far from yeah. here, Ten miles. two years ago, planted on July 15th that Shh, made 72 late. bushels. Dang. 57 XF1s. It's, so, it's an indeterminate, super tall growing bean, and we do a little bit different with them. So we plant them and we put, typically on beans, you don't put a lot of nitrogen down, right? That's right. They make their Lagoon. own. So on those, the name of the game is getting them as tall as you can so you can get them in the head of the combine. Yeah. So we'll put out 30 units or so of nitrogen at planting to kind of kick them off and get them growing before they Is really that, that like pop up with the planter well you can put out pop up with your planter you can put out a pre-plant because mm -hmm. you're going to be putting out phosphorus and potash yeah. and all that stuff yeah. on it too if you're going to treat it like the crop we yeah. talked about yeah um and then we put out that nitrogen shot and some of the guys will come around and they'll inject like 20 units or so mm -hmm. through the pivot while they're growing mm -hmm. and they'll get i can take you to some beans right now that are oh, this big that were planted gracious. late that are 57 xf ones and they're going to be killer Dang. So you made your corn crop, yeah. and you turn around and you get to make you a bean made, crop. Made some money that Same year. year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These before the before the leaves fell off, they were rubbing rubbing the bottom of my chest, which is the best beans I've seen in Clay County. Now Clay County ain't, ain't the bean mecca of the world by no beans, but this is the best I've seen in Clay County. They they were up around here, and, and I've showed on some of my shorts some plants like this one right here. So scattered throughout the field, there are plants that are, before the leaves fell off, were taller than me. Uh, right now they're about face level. Yeah, that's that's 150 plus pods on that plant right there. What, what do we know what causes that? And two part question, couldn't we just harvest these beans and possibly just pass on the genetics what created this or does that not work potentially we just call that a rogue plant sometimes you'll just see some type of twitch or change in the mm -hmm. genetics of one particular plant it does it in cotton you see it in yep. grain sorghum yep. 
I don't know that if you pulled this and you planted, it would duplicate this exact mm -hmm. same plant. Uh, I wish it worked that way. If it worked that way, we'd walk <laughs> through here and clip every one of these. Well, I don't know. We can't really do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> Monsanto or Bear wouldn't yeah, be pleased not, with you, it. Yeah, you can't do that. But but our breeders will definitely yeah. do that and say, okay, yeah. well, we've naturally selected for a dominant plant. That's you right. know, let's bag it up and see what yeah. happens. But I mean, you can look. There's one here. Here's three rows over. There's one. I'm looking about 15 yards up, 20 yards up. There's another one. There's one on that road. So they are scattered throughout this field. It seems, it looks almost like when someone has a little bit of rice seed mixed in with the wheat, you see that random rye shoot here and there. It almost looks like that out here. I just wish that if they'd all done this, we'd be we'd be looking at boats right now, trying to, trying to figure out where we're going fishing at. <laughs> Well, that's it for soybean school today. I hope all of y'all learned a lot. It is always my goal to educate you as much as possible on what it is we're doing out here on the farm, why we're doing it that way, and just give the, the layperson as much knowledge as possible about farming. I'm just here to teach and to show what it is we do. So I hope you found some knowledge in the information we presented today. I hope you enjoyed our talk with Jason. He's a very knowledgeable uh, seed rep for our area. And we're glad to have him in this area. He knows so much about corn, cotton, and soybeans. But tomorrow's a big day out here. We will find out the mystery, what the yield is. We'll gather up all these beans and then we'll be off to the races for peanut season. I thank all y'all for watching. I hope to see you next time.